Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner, and this is section 1.4 of Schroeder's An Introduction to Thermal Physics, and this is entitled Heat and Work. And this is another chapter where he talks a lot. There's not a lot of math here, but there are some very important definitions we're going to talk about. So we have the concept of temperature that we've already talked about. And I kind of gave you a definition in the first chapter, the first section, but really that definition is not a very excellent definition. It's more of a definition of what temperature does. We also need to think about something called energy, and we need to think about something we call heat. Okay. So temperature, the definition we had is temperature is the property of objects to spontaneously move energy into their surroundings, right? And we can, the, in temperature, the thing that is hotter, that has more temperature, will transfer energy to the thing that is colder. And this really isn't a definition of what temperature is. This is more of a definition of how temperature behaves, what it does. We've looked at a simple kinetic theory in the previous sections, and we kind of have a sense that temperature is related to the kinetic energy and the rotational energy and the spring energy that's associated with the atoms and the molecules inside of the material that we're talking about, right? Now, energy is also one of those words that, well, what is energy? And that's, that's a question, that's a philosophical question more than anything else. He points out here in the second paragraph, he says that this is a fundamental concept in physics. It's fundamental because energy isn't made of anything. Energy is a fundamental thing. It's like, what's an electron? Like, what's an electron composed of? An electron is an electron. There's nothing lower than an electron. So we, we talk about energy. We notice that energy can change its form from different kinds of energy. We've listed out many different kinds of energy. Uh, we have a rule of thumb of the conservation of energy, which, uh, at least for purposes of this book, we're going to assume it's true all the time. And uh, his, his image of energy is that it's some sort of fluid that can move around and flow and take different forms, but really it's not even a fluid, it's not even a substance. It's like more this thing that doesn't exist that's associated with things. Now the way that I understand energy is slightly different than the way he understands it, is he, he's presenting it as some fundamental cosmic thing that exists out there. To me, it's more of a bookkeeping method we use to understand what's going on in physics. So to me, like energy is a concept that arises because when you look at collisions with simple Newtonian mechanics, it makes sense that these values are conserved, and so we're going to talk about this conserved value. But really, energy itself isn't something fundamental to the universe. It's just something that we've noticed about the universe. The concept of the conservation of energy is one of these ideas that is so important that when we think we found a violation of the conservation of energy, we rewrite the physics such that we can maintain the conservation of energy. And there's a really good example of that in electrodynamics, when we've seen that as a particle accelerates or moves through a field, it actually transfers some of its energy, its kinetic energy, into the field itself. Rather than saying that kinetic energy disappeared and reappears when the field interacts with another particle, another charged particle, we say instead that the field itself, which is an imaginary concept, stores the energy inside of it. And so the field becomes something real because we'd like to keep the conservation of energy around and we don't want to find exceptions to this rule. This is the same thing that we do in thermodynamics. So in thermodynamics, we know that if we have some kind of object, that there will be energy going in and there may be energy going out. And inside there is going to be some, you know, a accumulation of energy, okay? That accumulation of energy is not temperature. Remember, temperature is more of a statement about how the energy flows and what happens. But the, the energy itself inside of the system can take more shapes than just the kinetic or the angular momentum or things like that. So the energy itself is not necessarily associated with temperature. When we, tick about, when we talk about the energy that can go into a system and the energy that can leave, we're going to think about two kinds of energy. One kind of energy we call heat, okay? And the other kind of energy we're going to call work. And for students of thermodynamics, especially new students, this seems like an arbitrary and almost meaningless distinction, but it's very important. The heat energy... This is energy that is due to the difference in temperature. 
So heat comes from the difference in temperature. And you can't turn it off. At best, you can just insulate the two systems from each other so the heat doesn't transfer. And heat always flows from hot to cold. Hot to cold. Okay. Work, on the other hand, doesn't need a difference in T. So there's no difference in T. So you can take your, your uh, soup, your hot soup, put it in a cold microwave, and when you turn that microwave on, the soup will get hotter. Okay, The microwave might get hotter too, but the microwave isn't necessarily hotter than the soup. Okay, And you can turn it off. So you can take the weight off the pressure, you can relax the constraints on the volume, you can turn the microwave on and off, you can connect or disconnect the battery. So you have some control over this, right? And this may be cold to hot. So when you see energy flowing from a cold thing to a hot thing, by definition, that's not heat, that's work, okay? The way he thinks about it is he say that work has some sort of agent, there's some sort of actor that's causing that energy to flow. And if they stopped doing what they were doing, then the energy would stop the flow. The way I like to think of it is it's something that you can turn off, right? Heat is always on, you can never turn it off, but work you can turn off, you can stop doing it, you can even sometimes reverse it. One of the difficulties we have in thermodynamics is the word heat is overused in the English language. It means something different than what it means in our physics context here. So for instance, I might say I take my hands and I rub them together, I push together and rub together, and I say I'm heating my hands. But in reality, this is not heating because the hands themselves are getting hotter than they already were. So we're not seeing a flow from hot to cold. And also I can stop rubbing my hands and they stop getting hot. And so it's something that I can control. So this is actually a form of work. It's due to friction, okay? This is actually how we first noticed that there was an equivalence between work and heat. Um, when uh, I think it was Thompson was noticing that when you bored out the holes in the cannons, it was creating a tremendous amount of heat. And he took a dull boring machine, he put the cannon barrel in water, and he started boring out that cannon with that dull, the dull bit, and he saw that the water started to boil. So there's some equivalence between the work and the heat. And it was Joule who was able to start quantifying these things. And today we, we understand that the conservation of energy says that the change in the internal energy of a system is always equal to the amount of heat that's been added and the amount of work that's been added, okay? Now, I should note that in some textbooks they use a minus sign here for the work we're going to use a plus sign in here. So work is the energy added to the system. Okay, so we have some internal energy here. U would represent the total internal energy, but rarely do we ever talk about the total internal energy. We're only interested in how the energy flows or changes over time. So Q is the heat and work is W. And that could be energy going in or out. So if it's going out, it's going to be minus. So if you have a hot object heating a cold object, then the heat for that object is going to be minus Q. The cold object will see a plus Q. And so we have the first law of thermodynamics. Which is basically this. The change in the internal energy of something is equal to the heat and work added to that system. There's no other way to change the internal energy. This is basically the conservation of energy law. Okay, And it, it might seem this word law, I think a lot of people get hung up on this word law. This comes from a time in physics when we thought of the universe as being governed by unbreakable laws. And our job was to discover these laws. I like the concept of laws. I think it's really interesting to find these rules that seem to apply everywhere. And like we would probably just say this is the first observation of the first rule of thermodynamics. The conservation of energy, we don't say the law of conservation of energy, we just say conservation of energy is a concept that may or may not apply in different situations, right? So the SI unit for work is the joule. And the joule is a Newton meter, which is a kilogram meter squared, per second squared, okay? 
However, when we were first investigating the change of an object due to the temperature, we were using a calorie. This is the old caloric theory that we, were, we had of how heat was a substance that was flowing from one object to another. And one calorie was measured by joule to be 4.2 4 joules. We know now today it's 4.186 joules. So one calorie. Now you might see if you buy some food and on the label it might say, you know, 100 calories or whatever. That's actually one kilocalorie. So that's a kilocalorie, which typically we write as a calorie with a capital C. And that's equal to 4,186 joules, okay? To give you kind of a sense of how powerful these energies are. So if I took a one kilogram mass and I started it from rest and moved it to one meter per second, right? So it's traveling one meter per second, pretty fast speed. Then that's only one half of a joule because one half mv squared, okay? And that is enough. So one calorie is enough to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius, one degree centigrade, right? So if you want to raise a gram of water, a, a tiny amount of water, just by a tiny amount of temperature, you're going to need like eight of those kilogram objects moving at one meter per second. That's how much work it takes. So there's a huge uh, disparity in how much energy you think is stored in a system versus how much work it takes to change the temperature of that system. Note that when you add heat or work, the system itself may or may not increase in temperature, right? So you can increase the internal energy of a system without increasing the temperature. There are typically three ways of conveying heat. One is called conduction. You can also use convection. And the last is called radiation. Conduction is when the two objects themselves, like these two pins, are in direct contact with one another. And so the atoms or molecules from this one substance are actually bumping into the atoms or molecules of the other substance, right? So conduction is what happens when you, when you grab something, you touch it with your hands. Convection is due to the air that's in the atmosphere um, touching this object and rising and, re and being replaced by more air that's cooler. And so you can feel like over a fire, you can put your hand over the fire and you can feel the heat of the fire. But what's really happening is that heat's being transferred via convection. There's also heat being transferred via ra radiation. So if you were to put a vacuum between the two objects and, and you were able to see that there was still heat being transferred, that's because of radiation. Okay. The problems are pretty simple. Uh, they're kind of fun. Uh, the first one is just a simple test to see if you got it. It should be pretty easy, especially with the rule that I gave you about being able to turn it on and off. The second one is trying to find an example of a process in which no heat is added to a system, but its temperature increases. So how can we increase the temperature of something without having something hotter than it transferring heat to it? And the other is the question reverse. Is there a place where you can take something hotter, transfer energy to something, and the temperature does not increase? Okay. If you're having a hard time thinking of that, uh, you might want to look up something called a calorimeter and see how that works. It might give you some ideas. Uh, the next problem, 128. Estimate how long it would take to bring a cup of water to boiling temperature in a typical 600 watt microwave oven. So this is a fun little exercise, okay? It's, it's kind of remarkable when you think about how much energy it takes just to change the temperature of something. It's, it's a remarkable amount of energy. Uh, 129 is interesting. Uh, it's a trick question. It really gets you thinking about this phenomenon. And so I'm not going to give you any clues about this problem. I want you to imagine the scenario that he provides there. And I want you to realize that this is a trick question and then figure out why it's a trick question, what the correct answer would be, and maybe even what the right question should have been. Okay. And whenever you consider trick questions, there's many different ways a question can be a trick question. So this is going to get you to really examine the whole problem. And problem 130 is to uh, take a spoonful of water in a bottle with a tight lid, make sure everything is at room temperature, measuring the temperature of the water with the thermometer to make sure. Now you close the bottle and you shake it as hard as you can for several minutes. When you're exhausted and ready to drop, shake it for several minutes more <laughs> and then measure the temperature again. Make a rough calculation of the expected temperature change and compare. So how would you calculate how much uh, energy you put into that water through the shaking motion? Well, I would think about um, how that water has moved, its velocity. 
and it, obviously there's a cyclical motion here. So you're, you're starting with one velocity, you're reversing the velocity, and so that's a change in the energy. And in order to do that, you had to push, push a force into the object, right? So that's something that's fun to interesting to think about. So think of the kinetic energy of the water as it keeps changing, okay? Anyway, uh, this is a fairly simple section. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, please find me on Discord. And be sure to like, share, subscribe, comment. And if you want to support this channel, you can find me on Patreon. Links in the description. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye.